who holds the most interesting academic title. He's a professor at the Center for Jewish Civilization at the very famous School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University. Uh, and he's got the most phenomenal breadth of knowledge. He's the author of 21 books and monographs and countless articles. I stopped, I tried to count, I estimated around 200, I stopped. Uh, the breadth of his expertise is astonishing. Just some of the courses he teaches, these are courses he's taught have included magic and religion in the Greco-Roman world, which is classical history, the beginnings of Judaism and Christianity, death, the soul and afterlife in the pagan Jewish Christian and Muslim traditions. I mean, think about that. The problem of God, which is expert in theology, and why the Middle East is a mess. And if that's not politics, nothing is politics. And that's just a fraction of the courses he's taught. I selected the subject for tonight's uh, lecture before I realized that Ori has taught a whole course in what is Jewish art. So I don't think I need to say any more. Uh, Ori, I wish we were together in person welcoming you, but Zoom will have to do. We're delighted to have you to give our annual lecture. What is Jewish art from Rembrandt to Shalom of Spot for the Mali and Lewis Kaplan Museum of Judaica at Congregation in Betsy Shuren. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, you can put questions into the chat. There'll be time to answer them at the end, but nobody's gonna be unmuted during the talk. And even though all our listeners are home, and muted, let's still applaud for Ori Solti. <laughs> Thank, Thank you very much. It is a pleasure to be here, which is to say I'm here in my own study. It's always a pleasure to be here. It's also a pleasure to be in Houston at this safe distance and uh, at uh, Bet Yishurun uh, virtually. And the, the topic that uh, I was asked to address is, again, what is Jewish art? And it's a topic that is uh, a favorite of mine because um, a lot of what I do in teaching, lecturing, writing, what have you, is uh, think about what humans think about. And one of the features of us as a species that I find uh, a fairly consistent one across our geography and throughout our history is um, the need to put things in boxes. We like to define things. The Latin root F-I-N means a boundary. So a definition is a box. It puts a boundary around something and decides what's inside it and what's outside it. And the fact of the matter is much of our human experience defies our need to define things. And yet we have that need which we persist and pursue. And Jewish art falls so wonderfully into the defined category of impossible to define because there are too many questions you have to ask that don't have easy answers or perhaps any answers at all in order to come up with what would be your definition of Jewish art. So one asks the question first of all about what you mean by Jewish and second of all what you mean by art and third of all if you're asking the question what do you mean by Jewish you have to ask it from two different angles at least. One is a historical angle because Abraham was called a Hebrew, he was not called a Jew. And the implications of that word in Hebrew have nothing to do with religion, they have nothing to do with ethnicity. It has to do with socioeconomics, the fact that he had flocks and he moved from place to place, he passed from place to place. That's what the implication of the word Hebrew is. And eventually, of course, his grandson Jacob would be renamed Israel. We all know about that famous wrestling match, one who has wrestled with God, Yisrael. And his heirs and descendants would call themselves Israelites. Again, you still don't see the word Jew or Jewish anywhere here. And that term had both a connotation of a kind of ethnicity bloodline in that those who called themselves Israelites for the most part understood themselves to be descendants of Israel and his sons so that it became a tribal group that eventually became a kingdom and so on and so forth. But it more importantly had a spiritual connotation because for example, the father-in-law of Moses, the Midianite priest no less, um, Ruel or otherwise known as Jethro who embraced the God of Israel clearly didn't suddenly become ethnically an Israelite. He remained a Midianite, but he became spiritually an Israelite. 
And eventually, of course, the kingdom of Israel divides in the course of the aftermath of Solomon's death and a civil war that leaves Israel in the north, Judea to the south, or Judah to the south. And really, the community that evolves toward the time of the time of Jesus is a Judean community. Now, it so happens that in English, we can distinguish Judean from Jewish. So I would call Jesus and those around him, those who believed he was someone special and those who didn't, Judeans. They're not Jews, they're not Christians. The Judeans for Jesus, Judeans not for Jesus. Eventually, one of those groups will become what we call Jewish and the other what we call Christian. But for example, the Bible we read isn't canonized until about the year 140. That's a century after the crucifixion. So Jesus didn't have a Bible as we do to read. A lot of it was in place. The Torah had been in place since 444 BCE, and certain prophetic books certainly were. But the definitive decision about what goes in, what goes out of what you and I call Bible had not yet really been made. So it so happens that in Hebrew or in Greek or in Latin or in Aramaic, you can't make the distinction Jewish-Judean. It's Yehudi, it's Yehudi, it's Yudaios, it's Yudaios. So it's easier using the language that were current, languages that were current in that period of time, not to make the distinction that I want to make between Judean and Jewish. So if I'm talking about Jewish art, then I'm talking about entities that have been made since whatever it is that Judaism is began. That doesn't mean, however, that I would ignore what happened before, just as I couldn't possibly ignore the Hebrew, Israelite, and Judean foundations of what Judaism is. It's just that I have to recognize they're not synonymous. And if I have that historical question, and I might uh, illustrate it in a very concrete sort of manner, I'm assuming that everyone can see the image that I just put up on the, on the screen. It's an artist's view of what Solomon's temple looked like. So this was a structure about which we have not a scintilla of absolute physical evidence, but we have a rather uh, ample description of it in the Book of Kings on the one hand. And on the other hand, in the Book of Kings, we also understand that the Israelites didn't build the Israelite temple. The Tyrians did, Hiram of Tyre. And the Tyrians were what we might otherwise call Northern Canaanites. And we know that the Northern Canaanites had a particular style of temple building that is not only suggested by the description of the Book of Kings of Solomon's temple, but archaeologically, if you go up to the site of Chatzor, to the Canaanite part of it, before Joshua and the judges and those characters got there, there are a number of temple areas, and one called Area G has a temple that the remains of which suggest this kind of a structure, that is to say, a longhouse structure twice as long at least as it is wide, with a tripartite interior division, uh, subdivision, a kind of entry area, then a main area, and then a kind of holy of holies, which is exactly what we get described as Solomon's temple. And there are the remains at Chatzor, the bases of two columns that stood in front of this structure. And lo and behold, of course, that's the oddest part of the description in the Bible of Solomon's temple, a pair of columns that are actually given names, Yachin and Boaz. We know what the words mean, but we have no idea why these columns are given that name. So if I'm looking at this structure, what I'm looking at is a structure designed not by Israelites, but by Tyrians, built not by Israelites, but by Tyrians, but on commission from and paid for by an Israelite king, who probably taxed the bejesus out of his Israelite population to raise the funds for it. And the point and purpose of it was to serve as a, a kind of point of meeting between the Israelites and their God, their concept of God, as opposed to Egyptian or Canaanite or Mesopotamian temples that are designed to serve those particular populations vis-a-vis -vis their sense of God. So it's an Israelite structure, but you understand it's still not Jewish, is it? Because Solomon is not Jewish, he's Israelite. The term doesn't yet exist. So if I look at this structure and assume that what the, 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 the sketch that I'm seeing is connected to uh, what it really looked like, I'm still not looking at a work of Jewish art, 
But it may turn out, and indeed it will turn out, that elements of this structure will play very important roles in the what is evolving into Jewish art once more than a thousand years after the time of Solomon, we get beyond the Israelites and beyond the Judeans towards what we might call the Jews. Which brings me to the conceptual issue of the phrase Jewish art. When I use that phrase, do I mean that something is Jewish because of the object itself, in this case, or if I'm talking about works of art of whatever sort, am I talking about symbols? Am I talking about style? Am I talking about subject? Am I talking about purpose, intent? Or am I talking about the identity of the artist? In which case, it's the artist is Jewish, therefore it's Jewish art. And by Jewish, is it a free for all? Or do I mean, well, you have to have been born Jewish. What about someone who converts to Judaism? Does that person's art suddenly become Jewish? What about someone who is an artist and converts out of Judaism? Does that individual's art suddenly cease to be Jewish? Does it have to do not with conversion or birth, but conviction? I'm an artist and the work that I'm making, I feel is informed by my Jewish identity. Or maybe I don't think about that. And along comes some art historian like me and says, are you kidding? You're doing this, 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 that surely comes out of your Jewish background. And then the artist either says, oh, you know, I never realized that, but you're right. Or pushes back and says, no, you're wrong, regardless. So we have a range of different ways of trying to answer what Jewish art is in terms of the identity of the art, the identity of the artist. And if we are talking about the art, for example, and as I said, are we talking about symbol, style, subject, and so on, we can relatively easily point to the idea of symbols and see something developing that we can call Jewish. The most prevalent symbol in Jewish art down through the ages, give or take, let's say, for the last 2,000 years, is the seven-branched candelabrum, the menorah, that, of course, is referenced as having been in Solomon's temple, and before that in the tabernacle in the wilderness. At the end of the book of Exodus, that Bitzalel ben Uri, under instructions from Moses, who gets instructions from God, builds. He builds a tabernacle, and among the paraphernalia within it, the most sig signal work is the seven-branched candelabrum. And so, ironically, one of the earliest, perhaps the earliest representation we have of it, such as you're seeing here, is on the underside of the Arch of Titus in Rome, which is recording, the, the arch was built around 90 or so. Um, it's recording the most, sorry, about 80 or so CE. It was recording Titus's most uh, extraordinary accomplishments when he had been emperor and before he became emperor in this memorial to him that his younger brother who succeeded him as emperor, Domitian built to repeat around the year 80. And the most important thing it seems that Titus's own people felt he had done was to finally bring to an end that five year long Judean revolt against Roman power that culminated by way of a kind of collateral damage with the destruction of the temple. And its paraphernalia was carried off in a triumph into Rome. So Rome is always symbolized in Roman relief sculpture by an arch, and that's what you've got here. And we can see that the menorah from the temple is itself being carried into Rome in this triumphant procession. On the other side of the arch, you've got Titus on a, in a, a quadriga, a, a, a chariot that is being borne by, by four horses and so on and so forth. So he's depicted in the middle of his Fifth Avenue parade, you know, after having just won uh, the, the, the New York, uh, won the World Series or something of that sort, an analogous kind of situation. So it's ironic that that's where we see the first instance of what becomes again and again a very, very important and popular symbol within what we might call Jewish art. So you see it, for example, here on the capital of a column of what was once a synagogue, there's not much left of it, from the late first century in Caesarea. You can see it jumping a few centuries later on, the middle of the sixth century, on the mosaic floor of a synagogue in the Northern Galilee. And here you'll notice that the depiction gives us not one, but two menorot, and also between them what we recognize as a kind of schematic stylized representation of the tabernacle of the Holy of Holies in the temple itself, including 
what is described in the Book of Kings as the curtain, the parochet, that hung before it, which is the same term will, that will end up being applied to the curtain that hangs before the Holy Ark in a synagogue. And you'll notice the pair of columns, both before, as it were, the outside and before the Holy of Holies themselves, underscoring that relationship in visual terms to the temple that had those pair of, that pair of columns, Yachin and Boaz. Now the question then becomes, are there two menorot in order for the artist to offer us kind of symmetry, possibly? Is it because there were two temples, the first and second, possibly? Or is it, and this is the interpretation that I prefer, because if you look carefully, they're not identical, and one has no candles lit, and the other has candles lit. I wonder if it's not the case that this represents the temple that was destroyed of the past. And this represents the temple of the messianic future, that the artist and his community would have understood this vocabulary easily enough, is hoping for in that future era when the Messiah comes. I might point out, by the way, that the sevenness of this menorah, which makes it such an important object and image and symbol over the course of, of the centuries, is not just related to the idea that it is an important artifact from the temple of the past and has connections both to the, uh, the, the past and the future in that sense. But the first menorah, I remind you, was done in the wilderness. And I remind you that that happened in conjunction with something else that was happening in the wilderness, which is that Moses came down from the mountain with a series of 10 commandments, or if I'm traditional, I believe that all 613 from the Torah he ultimately brought down. But what we get in Exodus 20 and again Deuteronomy 5 is a series of basic commandments that include one that says to remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And particularly in the Deuteronomy version of that commandment, we're reminded that God rested on the seventh day, rested, Shavat, right? A Hebrew verb that eventuates as a noun. God rested. So we who would emulate God, every people emulates its concept of divinity. We must rest on the seventh day. So the sevenness, which is after all a rather abstract concept, becomes rather concrete when we're looking at the seven branched entity in front of our eyes once, or in this case, twice, not only recalls the temple, but more broadly and deeply connotes the importance of the moment when the commandment among other commandments was given to our Israelite ancestors. All that that implies with respect to responsibilities, with respect to covenantal promises, in short, with respect to the past and the future, is swallowed up in the symbolism of the seven-branched candelabra, and ultimately connected back to the very creation of the universe as a seven-day kind of process. And so again and again and again through what we might call Jewish art history, we see this kind of an idea showing up. I fast forwarded all the way to the late 1870, late 18th century, 1772, South Germany, it's a parochet, in fact, a Torah ark curtain. We even know the guy who wove it. His name is Adolengi, because it's signed. And we recognize, of course, the seven branch candelabrum front and center. But by the way, we also notice another pair of symbols, yet again, a pair of columns, suggesting by synecdoche, right? The part stands in for the whole. That's a term that we typically use in, in literature, but we can also use it in art. So the part stands for the whole, the columns stand for the whole temple, as it were. And the two things that are particularly interesting about these columns are one, you'll notice they're kind of twisted. And the interesting thing about that, the irony about that is the twisting of columns that represent Yachin and Boaz in what we might call Jewish art only starts in the late 17th and the 18th centuries. And we can point exactly to the where and the when and how it began. From the Christian perspective, when the mother of Constantine, the emperor of the early fourth century, St. Helen, went on a pilgrimage in her late 70s to, is, to what was then called Palestine, and particularly the area around Jerusalem, there are two things she is said to have found and brought back to Rome. One was the true cross upon which Jesus had been uh, crucified 300 years earlier. The other was the pair of columns before the temple, the temple having also been destroyed 250 years earlier, she brought back the remains of those columns and she and her son built a new church 
They call it the Church of St. Peter. And they put those columns in front of the church, the point and purpose of which was to suggest that Rome is the new Jerusalem, St. Peter's is the new temple. And when at the end of the 15th through the early 17th centuries, a long stretch of time, a series of a succession of popes decided to rebuild, to create a whole new St. Peter's, which is the church you and I know of in Rome right now, that enormous structure. One of the fe uh, fellows, one of the artists, architects and sculptors, who was in charge of that project once it arrived to his time period, which is to say in the 17th century, built this extraordinary kind of structure called a baldachin, baldachino. It kind of hovers where the nave and the apse and the transepts all meet just before you get to the altar and below it is the place where St. Peter himself is said to be buried. And the baldachino is held up by four twisted columns because of a, an intended reference back to the columns that had stood before the temple, or sorry, the church of St. Peter in, the, in its earlier iteration and the idea that they were twisted columns. So it's a Christian tradition that those columns were twisted. But Bernini was such a world-renowned sculptor and architect. He did the Baldachin between 1623 and 1634. He did those wonderful, the colonnade around outside, creating a whole new plaza, piazza for St. Peter's. He did a lot of things. But his reputation was so renowned that gradually the idea of the pair of columns being twisted enters into the visual vocabulary, not only of Christendom, but of Judaism. And that's why they're twisted here. Moreover, if we look at those columns, we see they're decorated with grapes and grape leaves with vines. If this were a Christian image, so this is how images get shared, symbols get shared between traditions. In the Christian tradition, of course, it would be a symbol of Jesus. And the, the wine is like his blood. It all has to do with his sacrifice by crucifixion. In the Jewish tradition, it goes rather into the Hebrew prophets, where in Hosea, we are likened to being a vineyard that has to be tended. So we've got a range of different kinds of symbols here that connect us back to the temple and in a sense even beyond the temple in this kind of a, a parochet. And by the way, on the other hand, the symbol that everybody tends to think of as the preeminent Jewish symbol is not, not until we get to the 19th, late 19th century and the advent of Jewish nationalism, AKA Zionism, do we see the six pointed star starting to be rather universally thought of as a kind of Jewish symbol, as the Jewish equivalent of the cross. It makes its way gradually there in the late 16th, early 17th century in Central Europe, in the area of Bohemia, Moravia, kind of around Prague, you'll already see the six-pointed star being used that way. But historically, it was a pagan symbol that went back millennia, not centuries, millennia, before there was Judaism or Christianity or Islam. And it represents the meeting of realms, the triangle up interwoven with the triangle down, the male phallus stylized with the female pubis stylized. Heaven and earth, by extension, is the symbolic understanding of what this, this element is. And in the medieval period, you know, it was used in all kinds of contexts like alchemy. And it was sometimes called the Star of David, the Shield of David, the Star of Solomon, the Shield of Solomon. Gradually, five-pointed stars and pentagrams will be associated with Solomon and six-pointed stars with David. But the point is, this is far, far, far beyond the bounds of just a very specific Jewish symbolic language. So the fact that this happens to be from a, a, uh, a synagogue in Northern Galilee, on the Sea of Galilee, Kfarnachum, Capernaum, second, third century, doesn't mean that this is per se a Jewish symbol any more, of course, than the five-pointed star elsewhere on the same lintel is a Jewish symbol. It's just that this five and the six-pointed stars and the pine cones and the grapes and the, it's a whole series of stuff that was part of the vocabulary that pagans and Jews and Christians alike used in decorating their, their spiritual centers and slightly differently interpreted with respect to what was important within their particular tradition. So for Jews, the five-pointed star would connote the five books of the Torah. For Christians, it would connote the five wounds into Christ's body. Later on, the five-pointed star in Islam would connote the five pillars of Islam and so on. So we're talking so far about a handful of symbols 
that to a varying set of degrees we can identify as Jewish or Jewish but shared in a range of different kinds of ways or their stylistic, their stylistic features shared in a number of different ways. But all of that presumes and assumes that when we're talking about Judaism, we're talking about Judaism as a religion. And in that case, as we move through a succession of synagogues, we have certain objects that are particular to the religion of Judaism. No object being more particular, of course, than the Torah. And interestingly, the Torah is, uh, is never illuminated. It's never illustrated. Presumably because there's a bit of a discomfort with figurative representation in the context of the word of God, presumably because all of those beautiful illuminated Bibles within Christendom, we don't want anyone to mistake us for them, that sort of thing. But clearly it isn't the case that Jews have always, by any means, been uncomfortable with visual art or even with figurative art, even in the context of the temple, the synagogue, even within the context of the Torah. So this you will all recognize, of course, is a tas. It's a, a shield that underscores, as it sits, so to say, on the, on the chest of the Torah, that the Torah is a kind of stand-in for the high priest when the temple still stood, the primary intermediary between the people and God. Once the temple's gone, once that kind of a priesthood is gone, it's the Torah, the word of God, that functions as the primary intermediary between God and ourselves. And the scholars of that Torah are no more and no less than scholars. They're not a priesthood. So no rabbi has any more authority, as it were, than you and I in any kind of a particular way. What he may have or she may have is more knowledge than you or I, but not more authority, not more God-given authority. So here we're looking at a tas, and you can see we have our, our friends, the pair of columns. We don't have the menorah here, but we have... A, a schematic representation of the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, which, as you know, are a stand-in by synecdoche for the Torah at large. And we have bells that remind us that when the high priest walked around the precincts of the temple, he wore bells, in fact, they were pomegranate shaped, on the bottom of his garment, so people would give way, so they wouldn't get in his way. We have a crown that reflects a turn of phrase that we use to speak of the crown of the Torah, Keter Torah. And we also are reminded that there's a certain sense in which the Torah also is a stand-in for the Davidic house that is gone until such time as it be restored in the messianic future and so on. But most interestingly, of course, we have a pair of figures, Moses and Aaron. So not only do we have visual art, we have figurative art here. And this is relatively late in the game, I will admit. It's late 18th, early 19th century. But still, but here's the other thing, because it brings us to the other side of the question. When I say Jewish art, do I mean the artwork or do I mean the artist? Who made this? And the answer is almost certainly that the artist was Christian, because the guild restrictions and prohibitions made it difficult to impossible for Jews to engage in work that involved precious and semi-precious metals. So they had to turn to Christian craftsmen to craft Judaica. So Judaica, which we might think of as the most Jewish of Jewish art, if by that we mean the identity of the artist, not so. Conversely, if we go to the Muslim world, it was almost only Jews who were engaged in working with precious and semi-precious metals. So here we have what we can identify as a synagogue lamp. And I can say that with authority because I know the synagogue came out of in Marrakesh. If I didn't, since it has no inscription in Hebrew on it, I could easily as well assume this is a mosque lamp because the mosque has a lamp in front of the mihrab the way the synagogue has a lamp before the holy ark. And in fact, this particular element, this five-handed, uh, five-fingered hand called an Arabic khamse is most particular to the Muslim world, but was taken up by Jews in the Muslim world as well. It's a symbol of God's relationship to us. Our four-directioned reality, the four fingers, connected to and yet disconnected from the thumb, which, is, which symbolizes God because of its singularity. So there's nothing about this, per se, that would say, ah, it's from a synagogue that's Jewish for intent or purpose or style or symbol. The only thing 
almost certainly Jewish about it is that the artist would have been Jewish, whether it was designed for a mosque or a synagogue, the converse of the previous image from, from uh, Christendom that I just showed you. But again, we're speaking about, in all of these cases, we're speaking about Judaism as a religion. And we can say the same if we turn to the two kinds of places where we are likely to find illuminations in the textual reality of Judaism. One, of course, is the Passover Haggadah. After all, it's the Seder is celebrated not in the synagogue, it's at home. So whatever discomfort I might feel with my prayer book or my Torah or even my Bible being illuminated, I'm more likely to feel less uncomfortable with the Haggadah, which after all is also something I want to be interested in because I want the kids to stay awake. It's a long service. This is among the most famous of the Haggadot. It's called the Sarajevo Haggadah, made around 1400, around um, Barcelona. And stylistically, it's right out of the vocabulary of the Gothic style of Northeastern Spain and Southern France. These very attenuated figures that seem that they don't even have bones in their bodies. It's Miriam leading the women of Israel, praising God in a song of praise after they've come through the Sea of Reeds. And typical of medieval art, within one register, you've got two different scenes as if they're happening simultaneously. The praising of God, who, Eli, he is my God, vehu, I will praise him, which also means I will decorate him, which then becomes the justification for all kinds of decorative efforts connected with God. But at the same time, we're seeing the Israelites coming through the water, with the water piled to left and right of them and, and sketched out, you can see the, the Egyptian chariots that have been caught underwater. Or of course, Purim. Purim may get celebrated in the synagogue, but the book of Esther that we read on Purim, interestingly, had a hard time making it into the canon around the year 140. It was the last book to go in. And it's easy to understand why. The name of God is never mentioned. Eretz Yisrael is never mentioned. How can that be part of God's word and God's name isn't mentioned? So we celebrate Purim, but we don't open the Bible and read the book of Esther. We have always read a separate Megillah, a separate scroll. But the upside of that in terms of visual art is again, the one book of the Bible about which there is so little discomfort with visual representation is the Megillat Esther. And this particular one comes from Alsace in the late 18th century. And everything about it stylistically reflects that reality, that world. And the most interesting part of this to my mind is the figure we see here with the walking stick pointing into what we can discern as part of a zodiac. And of course, Purim takes place during Adar. Adar is Pisces, and that's what we've got in the zodiac here. So we've got a calendar wrapping its way around that textual rondel, just as we have other elements around this textual rondel, so that we certainly have plenty of visual art. And what makes this Jewish? The Sarajevo Haggadah was almost certainly the, the illustrations done by a Jewish artists. And the reason I say that is because when you get to the end of the illustrations before the text of the Haggadah begins, you have a depiction of the synagogue, people coming out of it, and the doors are open. You're looking all the way into the Holy Ark. It's not likely that a non-Jewish artist in northeastern Spain at the end of the 14th century would have had access to the synagogue to know how to do that. And the same can be said here, although with less certainty, because we don't know what the identity of the artist is. So it's perfectly conceivable, since these kinds of illuminated texts often had one artist doing the text and the other artist doing the illumination. It's just possible that a Jewish scribe did the text and a non-Jew did all the illustrations. But the point and purpose of both the Haggadah and the Megillah are to serve a Jewish purpose in terms of our calendrical cycle. Well, but is Judaism a religion? By the time we get to the 19th century, Ju Judaism is being thought of as a culture as a body of customs and traditions. By the 1870s, Wilhelm Marr, a German uh, pamphleteer and political philosopher, is recasting Jews as an ethnic group, a race, by coining that term or taking that term out of linguistics, Semite, to refer to Jews to say, you know, they're not really Europeans. They're not really Germans, all those German Jews, and they really pose a threat because they're not us, and they're trying to be us, because with emancipation, we've allowed them into the kind of, into the mainstream. By the late 19th century, of course, Judaism has started to take shape. 
resonating from the nationalist movements spreading all over Europe, self-conceived as a nation. And of course, by the 1920s, along will come Mordechai and Kaplan, and he'll say, well, no, Judaism is a civilization. It's got elements of religion, elements of nationalism, elements of ethnicity, elements of culture. It's got the whole thing, what really is properly called a civilization. And so if we're still trying to find Jewish art according to what Judaism is, and uh, we find ourselves uh, with a bit of difficulty. If we look at the other side of the equation, Jewish art and look at art, all right, art has through much of history been an instrument in the hands of religion. And we can see how that might work, except art also, and particularly in the modern era is thought of differently. Art is a reflection of the experience of the artist. The artist filters the raw data the objective reality of the world around him or her through the artistic sensibility, through the brain, through the eye, through the hands, and the art that results is a consequence of that. Well and fine, so then we ask the question, so what is Jewish experience if we're looking for a definition of Jewish art based on Jewish experience? And the answer is the experience of Jews in uh, Houston in 2021 is not the same of Jews in Moscow in. 20, 1921 is not the same as Jews in Jerusalem in 1821, is not the same as Jews in Kaifeng Fu, China in 1421. Jewish experience is so diverse because the Jewish experience in the diaspora has been so diverse. Uh, I remember there was a book that came out about mm, 25 years ago, maybe 30 years ago, and I, I, it doesn't matter who wrote it. A Jewish experience in the art of the 20th century, I think is what the title was. And I was asked to write a critique of it. And I, my criticism was the author never tried to define what Jewish experience is, and yet there it is in the title, and juxtaposes an image of something happening on the kibbutz in the 50s with something happening in New York at around the same, without any kind of comment that it's a different experience. So that said, we look, for example, at a work like this by uh, Moshe Mizrahi, who came from Iran. He was born in Tehran in 1870. And by 1890 or so, he had come to, to what was then Palestine. And now this is the first work I'm showing you from the Kaplan Museum's own collections. And he became renowned for particularly this kind of a work. It's called the Shiviti. So it's a work that I hang on the wall in my house to orient me towards Jerusalem or towards the east, if I'm not in it, or near Jerusalem, so that when I'm praying at home, as opposed to in the synagogue, I kind of direct, this helps me direct my thoughts. So I just use it as a focus of med meditation. And we recognize uh, a very charming folk kind of style. And the primary subject here, as you can see, is uh, Akedat Yitzchak. So it's the binding of Isaac. We saw Isaac labeled. We saw the altar labeled. We see the fire labeled. We see Abraham labeled. We see the angel labeled, who is the one who says, wait, 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 Abe, don't do it. Genesis 22. We see the ram that is caught in the thicket. And below that, in the same frame, we have a different moment. We have Abraham and Isaac kind of heading on the journey. Abe has the knife. He took Sarah's biggest kitchen knife. And he's got the ish, the, the fire in his hand. Isaac is a studious kid. Look, he's, he's reading. And by the way, he looks like a man in his 30s, which is, of course, if you look at the text, what you'd expect of him. Not the nine-year-old that is how he is most typically, not always, but most typically represented, particularly within the vast sweep of Christian representations of this image. And by the way, there are many, many Christian representations of this image because this this passage in Genesis 22 is as important for Christianity as it is for Judaism. So the subject is not inherently Jewish, is it? It's both. Of course, the way it's handled and the fact that it's overrun with Hebrew, both the things that are identified and the passage from Genesis 23, uh, 22, excuse me, around the frame, even the, the, the mule is identified, is you might say Jewish. And the, the, the two young men who were supposed to help out are waiting at the bottom of the mountain while Abe and, and, and Isaac go up the mountain. And he's got them as, this is the 1890s. These are Ottoman Turkish soldiers smoking uh, their pipes, the hookah, as they wait calmly. 
But we also have on the bottommost register, if you recognize that moment, which is much later when Eliezer, the servant of Abraham, went with 10 camels and so on, he went to find a wife for Isaac. And that wife, of course, is Rebecca, as we get here from later on in Genesis. So he's combined this apogetic moment where Isaac is as much willing to live to, to, to obey the covenantal God as Abraham is, who doesn't speak up, who doesn't say, hey, are you sure you know what you're doing, dad? Until the angel appears. Both of them share this quality of extraordinary faith in the fact that it's in God's hands, it's gonna work out. But he has followed that medievalist idea of having different moments, uh, not in, a, in, in chronology within the same frame as if it's all happening at the same time, because it's a kind of timeless time. And very, very differently from that kind of an approach to reality is when we look back to Europe and what's happening by the middle of the 19th century with the beginning of a small but steady and eventual, ex eventually extraordinary explosion of Jewish artistic participation in the visual arts, you have with the development of a middle class, what's called genre art, a middle class that wants its own kind of art and not this fancy, high church, high royalty kind of art. And a subset of that is the burgeoning Jewish middle class that wants its own Jewish genre art. And one of the more important uh, figures in this is the German Jewish painter, Moritz Oppenheim. And this is a work from about 1815, it's called Sabbath Afternoon. All right, we can certainly call this Jewish art. We've got a Jewish subject, we've got a Jewish artist. What exactly is going on though is very interesting because this is a world which is very much in transition within the Jewish world and with respect to the relationship between the Jewish world and the larger Christian world outside it. So we've got the old man leaning back, his eyes closed, the sun coming in through the window on the Shabbos afternoon. He did two versions of this, by the way. One of them, he's wearing a, a completely white kittel, so it even further separates him visually from everybody else. The young boy, perhaps pre-bar mitzvah, perhaps he's practicing his bar mitzvah speech for grandpa. But he is part visually of this arc, you see it? From which the old man leans away, he's not part of it. And what, and who is within the arc? Not only this kid, but the young man, presumably his father. And what is he doing? What traditionally Jews did for centuries on a Shabbos afternoon, he's studying a black Gemara. We can recognize that that's a Talmud text. But what makes this different from centuries and centuries of that activity is that instead of being off in the kitchen while he is doing this alone or with men, we've got women part of this arch. So it's a work that reflects the complications for Jews in the transition that is being experienced, Jewish experience, moving through the 19th century by way of emancipation, by way of new possibilities, for Jews to be part of the mainstream and not marginalized, which leads not only to varied definitions of what it means to be a Jew from within and from without, but also how exactly to fit into the mainstream. And the interesting thing is you see different angles at which this engagement of past present is un undertaken. So this is another work from the Kaplan collection where we've got a work by Isdor Kaufman. And you can see it's a yeshiva bocher. Now, Isidore Kaufman is not part of the Yeshiva Bocher world. He thinks of himself as a modern, secular Jew. He's a painter. And yet he feels a kind of nostalgia for a world that he associates with his parents and his grandparents and his great-grandparents, a world which is still available only to the East and Eastern Europe that he is romanticized and idealized with this Yeshiva Bocher and images of rabbis and images of the Beit Midrash an image of the synagogue, images of the synagogue, and so on and so forth. And both of these last two images contrast rather dramatically with the work that you're looking at here from France in the late 1860s, and it's by another Jew, his name, of course, is Camille Pissarro. And Pissarro is one of the founding fathers of Impressionism. And one of the features of Impressionism that particularly in the work of Pissarro and Monet stands out is that if there are figures, they're relatively small, it's much more about landscape and about nature and what have you. And if you ask yourself, as opposed to the previous two images, where we've got very clearly a pair of Jewish subjects, 
What's Jewish about this subject? The answer is nothing. What is there about Pissarro's work, who was a very secular Jew, that I can point at by looking at any given work that I might say identifies as Jewish, and I'd say nothing. On the other hand, one of the interesting things about Pissarro, or I should say a couple of interesting things about Pissarro, three to be precise, are one, that he never achieves, not that's the wrong verb, he never arrives at a canonical style. When Monet gets to the 1880s, you always recognize a Monet. When Renoir gets to the 1880s, you always recognize a Renoir. You never always recognize a Pissarro. You know his work, you don't, because it's varied, because he's always searching. He's always looking for new styles. He even experimented for three or four years with this new post-impressionist style called Prentilism that his son, Lucien's buddy, Seurat, was kind of inventing. So is that out of his Jewish consciousness, this searching, searching, searchiness? Secondly, he is the only one amongst them, and he does this preeminently, who is reading the scientific literature about optics, about spectroscopy, about how light breaks up into color, which is the thumbprint of Impressionism. But Monet and Renoir are doing it instinctively. Pissarro is reading about it. He's writing about it. He's talking about it. So is this book man a book man because he's Jewish, or is it just coincidence? And thirdly, and perhaps most significant, in his letters to his son, Lucien, he talks about the obligation of us artists as we're learning new things about the world around us, to share what we learn not only with fellow artists, but with the world at large. He talks about a social responsibility for art, or what I would call a secular sense of tikkun olam, of repairing the world, which is evidenced nowhere else among the Impressionists. Is that a function of his being Jewish? So I can point to any number of things and speculate but obviously nothing is certain about it. And certainly the same thing can be said if I jump into the 20th century and look at the work of Amadeo Modigliani from Livorno, Italy. Those figures give, have very little about them that would suggest per se the fact that he's a secular Jewish artist, Jewish Italian artist. Modigliani did only four landscapes in his life that we know of anyway. And this is one of them. And this was done in 1917. By that time, he was 33. He knew he was dying. Um, his lungs were a mess. He, he was coughing up blood. He used to take pride in showing his bloody handkerchief to people at the bar. I'm sure they loved it. He loved the fact that his nickname, Modi, was a pun. Because in French, Modi, M-A-U-D-I-T, means cursed one. Because he loved the idea of the cursed artist. Those whom the gods love die young. He loved the idea he's going to die young. But he yearned we understand from his friends who survived him, that part of him yearned for the Italian Jewish childhood that he left behind when he was doted upon by his Jewish mother and aunts and sisters and got to do whatever he wanted. He was everybody's favorite. As close as he got back to Italy was the South of France in that summer. And he did this landscape called the Landscape of the South, Paysage du Midi. And we recognize the influence of Cezanne in the way in which he's put the pigment on with palette knife and allowed the canvas to show through. The road leading into the distance, an, an element that begins with Corot in French painting. And Cezanne's structure of a painting, Mont Saint-Victoire in the background, buildings in the middle ground, foliage in the foreground, except what has Modigliani done with this? He's turned the mountain and the, and the architecture into one mountainous structure, this house towering above it. And the landscape has been reduced to this one scrawny tree, which lo and behold rises, bifurcates. And we have together with the window and the peak of the house, a seven branch menorah. And the two branches that have foliage, in fact, it looks like flames, not foliage. I'm not suggesting that Modigliani sat down and said, I'm gonna paint me a menorah tree. What I am suggesting that out of his Jewish unconscious, when he's thinking back to that Jewish Italian childhood in which he'd been so happy, when he sees death around the corner, that the image that comes out of that unconscious and plants itself onto the canvas is based on that quintessential Jewish visual symbol over the centuries. Conversely, that was 1917. If I jump a, a decade further forward and turn briefly to sculpture, this is a work by uh, Jacques Lipschitz, who came from Lithuania to Paris. They all came to Paris. And in 1927, did this work called Pierrot Escaping. 
Well, Pierrot is that clown in the Comedia dell'arte who makes you laugh while he's weeping within. And Pierrot, in this case, who is escaping, can't escape. The ladder is attached top and bottom to the window. And we realize the window is marked by four cruciforms. And Pierrot himself is a quasi-cubistic figure stylized to look like a Star of David. Is this not Pierrot the Jew, the Jewish symbol, who can't escape the Christian backdrop, even if he converts? This is 1927. This is 45 years after Wilhelm Marr was talking about Jews as a race. This is six years before Hitler would become chancellor of Germany. And once he does, trust me, all you need is one Jewish grandparent to get a one-way ticket to Auschwitz because it's not about your religious persuasion. It's about your presumed bloodline. Meanwhile, while all of this has been developing in Palestine, where we saw um, Moshe Mizrahi arriving to Jerusalem and making that Shiviti, um, that, that Shiviti panel, Boris Schatz in 1906 had, with the, the imprimatur of the Zionist leadership, created an art school in Jerusalem called the Betzalel School, named for Betzalel ben Uri, the guy who created the tabernacle and within it the menorah at the end of the book of Exodus in the Torah. And its point and purpose was to create Jewish national art. Schatz had come from Bulgaria, where he'd been the court sculptor and painter of Ferdinand III, the king of Bulgaria, who was trying to define Bulgarian art as Bulgaria achieved its independence from Ottoman Turkey. And the interesting thing about Schatz is he's also part of the era in which the line is being blurred between craft and art. Craft is something that you use. Art is something you merely look at. He says a craft object, an ashtray, or in this case, a frame, can be every bit as spectacular as, in this case, what it frames. We're not sure who did the painting. It may be Manet Katz, I'm not sure, but you can see that Schatz's spectacular metalwork gives you an extraordinary frame. And it's part, pun intended, of his framing what is he's hoping to create as Jewish national art by way of its own vocabulary of symbols. In the end, it becomes the basis for what will eventually become Israeli art. He brings into his team extraordinary artists like Abel Pan, who was born in Latvia, who comes and teaches at Betzalel, who, among other things, takes up the Bible, another Bible image. You can recognize this spectacular work also from the Kaplan collection, which is, of course, Vaihi Or, Let There Be Light. Or this, perhaps the most renowned of his biblical il illustrations, which is, of course, Adam and Eve within the garden. And notice, aside from uh, the overall spectacular quality of the work that in particular, all of those, the red foliage, because we don't associate redness except it's autumn, when it's autumn, with foliage. And yet Pissarro had been the one to say to Gauguin, if you see a tree as blue, paint it as blue as you want. And Gauguin paints grass red and Pan is painting leaves red. It's part and parcel of this movement, uh, of this idea of expressing your sense of reality as far as your sense is concerned, and not necessarily as you think objective reality is supposed to speak, is, is supposed to look. But the point is, here we're back to the Hebrew Bible again as a subject matter, and we've got a Jewish artist as a subject matter. In this case, also from the Kaplan collect collection, we've got this wonderful depiction in high and low relief carved wood of Jacob blessing Ephraim and Manasseh, there's Joseph, there are his two sons, see Jacob switching his arms. But this is done by a German Protestant artist. We, he's anonymous, we don't know who it was. And I wonder if for him as a Christian, the whole idea of Ephraim and Manasseh being shifted in the blessing is again a symbolism of God's preference, used to be for Judaism, now for Christianity, it's called supersessionism. So this has a distinct Christian symbolic meaning, I would prognosticate, for the artist who made it. Um, and the fact that it's Hebrew biblical doesn't mean that it's per se Jewish by any means. Uh, the same might be said of this wonderful work that just came into your collections um, by Rembrandt. I want to see if I can expand it just a little bit on my screen. It's, of course, the triumph. There's Mordechai. There's Haman the triumph of Mordechai. It's from the book of Esther again, this wonderful work 
that Rembrandt did, and you have others in your collection, but Rembrandt did many, many works, not only of Hebrew biblical subject matter, but in which he had local Jews because he lived for many years among them in the part of Amsterdam where he lived, posing because he felt it was more authentic if he had real Jews playing these Hebrew biblical kinds of roles. He's got a spectacular image of the leading Sephardic rabbi at the time of Amsterdam from 1643, Manasseh ben Israel, that is a far more effective representation of Manasseh than the standard issue image by Shalom Italia, the Jewish artist, image of Manasseh ben Israel. And you look at those two and you say, all right, which of those images captures the Neshuma, the soul of Manasseh ben Israel more effectively, the Jewish soul? Rembrandt or Shalom Italia, which of them, so to say, is a more Jewishly Jewish image? And we can follow biblically the book of Esther further forward back into the 20th century to an artist again from the Kaplan collection like Moshe Oved, um, who uh, uh, was born in, in 1885 and he lived until 1958. And with that name, you figure, oh, he must have moved to Israel, right? wrong. He visited all the time. He actually lived in London. He came from, uh, from Eastern Europe. He ended up in London. And this is a chess set. But of course, it's not just a chess set, is it? Where did chess originate? In Persia. Shach, shachmat, chessmate. Those are Persian, by way, uh, uh, Persian words that enter into Hebrew and enter into English. And so if you look along the bottom here, you in fact can see an inscription in Hebrew. It's about Esther. And if you look at this detail, of the chess set, you can see this Ahasuerus, who is, you know, not the sharpest tack in the in the bunch, and you can see him scratching his head, maybe a little bit confused, and look at Esther. She knows who she is. By the way, she knows who she is. She's not someone who's terrified about getting her head chopped off when she shows up uninvited into the king's th throne room, which is how artistically she is typically shown through the ages within Christian representations of Esther, and sometimes Jewish representations. But uh, Moshe Oved certainly sees this uh, through a very different set of eyes. Well, meanwhile, as we move through this period from the time of Betzalel to the time of Moshe Oved, um, there is a lot going on in the Jewish world. And um, Lionel Rice, who was born in Galicia in the age of four, he came to the United States in 18, that would have been 98, in New York. And he ended up with a very successful career as um, doing art and advertising. And in 1930, he left New York, closed up his shop. He went to Europe because he sensed that something not good was happening to the Jewish communities across Europe. And he created this vast array of images, paintings and prints and etchings, uh, a couple of books. But the one that came out in 1938 was called My Models Were Jews. This particular image from your collections is a bit earlier. It's from 1922. But you can see it's another record of the Eastern European Jewish community in its particularly ruralized form, the fiddler on the roof form, that is romanticized by Western culture and artists all the way up to fiddler on the roof. It's, of course, it's the blessing for the new moon. You can see there's no moon up here, right? It's dark, the blessing of the new moon. The same year that he did this was the year when Chagall did this work, which is in your collection and just given to you, as a matter of fact, newly in your collection, which of course shows, uh, it's called the rabbi. And if you look more carefully, we realize it may be a rabbi, but it's Sukkot. He's got the lulav here, the etrog there, and it's Shagal after all. So he's got a little rabbi on his own head. It's kind of my conscience, which is on my head. Am I doing it right? Am I keeping the customs as I'm supposed to? Which is surely a question Shagal would have asked himself from time to time who was, after all, not in the traditional sense, a particularly religious Jew, uh, and someone who often went well in a different direction for his imagery. So the same year that the book by uh, Lionel Rice was published, My M Models Were Jews, is the same year when Kristallnacht marked a point of departure in Nazi Germany for an explosion of violence against the Jews. And it's the same year when Chagall did the white crucifixion that hangs in the Art Institute of Chicago. Is this Jewish art? The most Christian of symbols, the crucified Jesus, except a loincloth that looks a lot like a talit. Not angels hovering ahead, but Jew, uh, overhead, but Jewish uh, elders. Look at the tefillin box on the head of this guy. 
a synagogue on fire, a guy running to protect the Torah scroll, another running away, and he's got an, what is now blank, but x-rays show he had written Yudah, Jew, on it. So clearly it's very conscious of what's happened, Jews. Everything going upside down, Moishe Kapoira is the Yiddish phrase, and that was, of course, his primary language, Yiddish. The visual image comes from the Russian Revolution, where he went back to Russia from Paris during the World War I and stayed after the Russian Revolution, eventually came back to Paris. His reference point are the Bolsheviks and the Mensheviks, the Jews caught in between. In Yiddish, to have a pickle or a sickle on your back is to have a world of troubles, and that's a Jew. He's got it again and again. We have a Torah scroll, not on fire, but it's flames coming, licking the bottom of this ladder. We've got a seven-branch menorah, our old friend, except look carefully. There are only six candles. The sabbatical seventh, the salvational seventh, the Shabbat seventh is missing. And look where the flames lick the bottom of the ladder. In Western Christian art, a ladder up against the cross usually has Nicodemus or Joseph of Arimathea or both on it, gently, lovingly taking the body of the Savior in its human quality, human capacity from the cross to lay it down, to mourn it, and then to bury it. It's the only empty space on the canvas. It's technically empty. Because this is not the guy whom every Christian looks at through special glasses. This is a suffering Jew who is being martyred for his faith. There is no salvation for the Savior. There is no Messiah coming for this messianic figure because that's not who or what he is. The latter is empty. So my proposition, of course, is that Chagall takes this most Christian of images, of symbols, and transformed it in something emphatically, emphatically Jewish. Of course, the other shoe dropping, and I'm nearly finished if anyone's getting worried about the time. The other shoe dropping when we think of Jewish history as it is taking its oh-so-peculiar shape in the middle of the 20th century is that if on the one hand we have the Holocaust, on the other hand, of course, we move from the Holocaust gradually toward the creation of the State of Israel. And Mane Katz, another work from your collections, who may or may not have done that painting that was framed by Boris Schatz, another story for another day, did this image of the old rabbi in 1942, compare this in your mind's eye with the Kaufman and the Oppenheim paintings, and Kaufman gave us a yeshiva bucher, but he also did many rabbis. The style is completely different. It has a kind of impressionist, expressionist sort of looseness to the brushwork. It's not trying to give you the illusion that you're looking through a window into three-dimensional space and looking at a real figure. You understand this is a painting. And in a sense, you're looking at it as part of completing the painting, which is an idea that the impressionists, first among them Pissarro, began to develop. This was done in 1942, right in the middle of the war somehow. So that gives a different angle of the expression of this rabbi who has this kind of mournful look and one wonders what about. Mane Katz, of course, would end up in Israel and that's where he's got a spectacular museum uh, named for him with his work within it. So I associate him more with Israel than, uh, than what preceded. And that brings me to, to three, more, three, three last images. This is one done by Salvador Dali. He was commissioned to do a series of artworks in 1967, 60, 1968, excuse me, to commemorate, to honor the 20th anniversary of the founding of the State of Israel. So he's got this dramatic, muscular, eyes looking up to the heaven figure wrapped around with the Israeli flag. Which of these is more Jewish? This one or this one? Or is each of them Jewish in a different way? And by the way, in the first case, the artist was Jewish. In this case, he's not Jewish at all. He's from Spain. And as we see art developing in Eretz Yisrael, what happens is that Israeli art isn't necessarily a synonym or an answer to the question, what is Jewish art? Because there are, first of all, Jews and non-Jews in Israel. And second of all, there are those who are born there and those who come there. There are those who are born, th born there and go away. There are those who were born elsewhere and come to Israel and Aliyah. Shalom Askovitz or Shalom of Safed is someone whose storyline shifted a hundred years later is somewhat similar to the storyline um, uh, that we referenced earlier of, of Moshe Mizrahi. And he ends up in Safed, he's a watchmaker and a watch repairman. 
And his neighbor is an, a younger Israeli artist by the name of Yossel Bergner. By the way, his specialty, Bergner's specialty is surrealism. He makes kitchen utensils walking along the street like humans. Shalom of Safed is also a kind of primitivist. And most typically, his subject matter, so we have come full circle, is biblical. What he often does is to give you a biblical scene, let's say Moses at Sinai above, and the description is in Hebrew, and then below he'll have the celebration of Shavuot, which of course commemorates Sukkot, Zman Matan Torah, and the inscription below will be in Yiddish, which is the language he mainly spoke to his dying day because he was part of a community, the ancestry of which predated when Hebrew was becoming the language. In this case, it's all Bible, but he's played with it in an interesting way. You go from below where you've got the inscription in Hebrew that tells us about Noah and his wife and his sons and, her, and, and, and his uh, daughters-in-law. And this is the ark, actually. And we've got Mo and his wife, and we've got Shem, Ham, and Japheth and their wives entering the ark. And then it describes here how he took from the pure animals, the Hemat and the not pure animals and the birds two by two and put them into the ark. And so you've got them going two by two, two by two of all sorts and all kinds. And um, I think he's also interested in emphasizing with that turn of phrase, the kosher and the non-kosher. So there's an undertext which has to do with Jewish gastronomy and only Jewish gastronomy. Because only in the Torah do you have this extensive description of what you may and may not eat. And that's what he's given us here, a reminder of what you may and may not eat. So it's the language, again, that is part of it, which brings me to my last image, where we end up with the quintessence of the people of the book and the people of the image engaging and embedding and interweaving text with image as we've seen from time to time all along this afternoon. This is a work by uh, Kalman Delmore. He actually uh, lives he's in Jerusalem. And he was, this work was part of an exhibit that I just recently curated here in Washington, in which he has done a self-portrait. And you can see in the middle of this head, there is a maze. And in the middle of that, there is the word Hineni. Here I am. The words, the words spoken by Abraham in Genesis 22, when God says, hey, I want you to take your son and take him up the hill and turn him into a French fry. And it's the same word that Moses answers when in Exodus 3, he's approaching in the wilderness, this funny bush that is on fire but won't burn, and he hears this voice, and he says, here am I, he named me. But it's a statement of, I am what I am, what I am, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. I am an artist, I'm a Jewish artist. My identity is textual and visual. Wrapping around to create my face is the, the phrase that, that, that reminds us that the beginning of wisdom is a awe or a fear of God. And what's inside his head is a maze. That is, it's not something that we can find our way around all that easily, in and out, where it begins, where it ends. It's kind of like the question of what Jewish art is. And maybe it's that question with its maze-like unanswerability that is the consummate Jewish art, after all. Thank you all very much. Ori, that was such a remarkable lecture. Uh, I could have listened all night. I wish you'd go on all night. I don't, <laughs> the others wish, I don't know if the others wish that, but it was absolutely fascinating. And uh, of Thank course, you. I'm very glad that you showed so many of the objects from the museum. By the way, that first uh, Torah breastplate was also from the museum collection too. That's right. Sorry, I did not mention that. Didn't I have should to. have. It didn't, didn't have to. It was, it was really such a thought provoking, such a thought provoking talk. And I think everyone really was a very large crowd. I think everybody really appreciated it. Now, I don't know how to deal with a question and answer. Here comes a question. What do you think of artists like Franz Klein, Klein Jewish, Jewish by, by birth only? only. Um, you know, I've run across any number of those. And in some cases, I'd say, look, you win some, you lose some. Um, so th there are artists who uh, are so completely distant from their Jewish identity that I simply accept that. 
but there are a good number of them, first of all, and I, I think of uh, Louise Nevelson, for example, who grew up in Maine, speaking Yiddish. They were the only Jews around, right? And who is not eager to identify herself as a Jewish artist. With the first book I did on Jewish art, she would not allow me to put her or her image in it. Um, and the work I wanted to talk about, you know, she does these found, these sculptures made of found objects, wood, and she paints them in, in, in single colors. So there's this wonderful thing. It's got six, count them, six parts, it's painted black. You're going to tell me that she wasn't thinking at all about the six million on the Holocaust? I found that difficult to believe. And then there are artists like Barnett Newman, Mark Rothko, Adolf Gottlieb, concerning whom the critics, most of them Jews, said, oh, there's nothing about the world outside the canvas that, that they're painting. It's only about form, it's about color, it's about line, it's not about content. And Clement Greenberg and Harold Rosenberg are dead wrong because these guys are in those studios talking about how, where do we fit in as Jews into the history of Western art, which for 15 centuries has been largely Christian art. And how do we as artists respond? How can we not respond to the Holocaust? And they were very interested in Isaac Luria the 16th century Safford Cap capitalist, one of whose emphases was, guess what? Tikkun Olam. So I look at those large canvases without frames, right? Frames traditionally separate what's on the canvas from what's outside. So they're literally wrapped around the, the stretcher and the pigment is going around the edges. So it blurs the line between the canvas and outside the canvas. And you look at these works and they're drawing your eye toward the center and light scintillates with them. This is tikkun olam in a secular messianic kind of manner, these heroic canvases. It's going back to Genesis. There was light and that started the ordering. We're trying to reorder with light. And Newman has a painting here in the National Gallery of Art, by the way, which is called The Name. Well, Hashem, and you look at the painting and, and it is a visual circumlocution of a painting symbolic of an analogous to the way we verbally use God's name circumlocutionarily. And because it's an all white canvas, no color, is that a painting? But white chemically is all colors. The color is absent, the color is present. What's the big question that the theologians ask about God? Where was God at Auschwitz? For some, absolutely gone. I'll never believe in God again after what I saw. For others, I couldn't have survived without God. God was both present and absent. And I would suggest that Barnett Newman's white painting with two gold strips that turn into a kind of triptych is answering that question. So my long-winded answer to your question is, there are a lot of artists who don't recognize for the Jewish content of their work, and there are artists who don't recognize their Jewish content in their work, and there are artists for whom I guess there is no Jewish content in their work, period. Amazing answer. Here, here's another one. Can you handle a couple more? Sure, I'll handle as many as you want to give me. All those artists are in your first book that I have. What do you think of the new generation of Jewish artists who are producing visual midrash right. in many media, say members of the Jewish art salon right. in which right, you right, are right. an advisor? So um, I actually curated an exhibit for them in Jerusalem at the Jerusalem Biennale about three years ago. Would you so tell me a lot they, of them? I don't, even know, I don't even know who they are, so. Uh, so Jewish Art Sal Salon was founded by Yona Ferver. She is the main figure, um, uh, uh, Richard, what's your last name? I'm blank on Joel Silverstein, uh, uh, Richard, uh, uh, ba, ba, ba. he's got an Irish last name. He's, he's very <laughs> from and he's got an Irish last name. Richard McBee. Uh, known for writing on art, but also a, as an artist. Anyway, they're all about uh, artists whose Jewish identity is not an issue or a question or a problem for them. The question is, in what endless range and array of ways do I express it? The exhibit from which that last image by Delmore was drawn that I did here in Washington in this last month, it was about Jewish authenticity and identity. These are all artists who self-identify as Jewish and whose work that they submitted to me for consideration, one way or another, could be associated with Jewish identity. The one I showed you is rather obvious, but there are others that are more subtle. So my long-winded answer again to your question is, it was just a matter of time. Um, 
the the explosion of Jewish visual artists that has expanded um, like a, a, a slow motion mushroom cloud, you know, since the 70s, it, it was just a matter of time when it would swallow up everyone feeling the obligation to respond somewhere in their art to the Holocaust, and then swallow up beyond that an endless range and way and array of ways of expressing their Jewish identity, which does not mean that they're not also in touch with other aspects of their identity. To say that my, uh, my art has a Jewish component doesn't mean it doesn't have other components as well. And unfortunately, we're very slow, we meaning whoever the critics are, you know, the, 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 the art world is, um, not to be uncomfortable with saying it's Jewish art. It's okay to say it's black art. It's okay to say it's Hispanic art. It's okay to say it's uh, uh, women's art, which by the way, all of which are turns of phrase which limit the art you're talking about. What makes Gent uh, uh, Artemisia Gentileschi a great artist? Yes, she was a woman and her experience as a woman informed some of the things she did like these spectacular Judith and the Head of Hall of Fairness works because she was raped by the guy her father let her study with and the anger against that and against the court that of course found her responsible, not him, is reflected in that painting. But what makes her a good artist is she's a good artist. And if you look at Jacob Lawrence and you think, wow, that stuff is good. It happens to reflect on the black experience in America during a certain time period, but it's art that is good, not because it's black art. And the same can be said for whatever you, you put in front of it as a modifying adjective. So so-called Jewish art um, still finds itself more often than it should in a position of not really being acknowledged as legitimate because of that adjective, um, which is unfortunate. But these are all artists who are taking that adjective and putting it proudly on their chests and not trying to hide it away somewhere embedded in some arcane symbolic place in their work. Okay, here's another one. I figured this one was gonna come along after a while. Uh, Jewish by birth only, that's offensive. I don't think it's offensive, but this questioner did. Who decides who is Jewish in the right way? Isn't that part of the lesson of Professor Salty's lecture? Absolutely. The only one who decides is the artist. No one has, no, I, I don't think anyone is, uh, is positioned to decide what the right way is for somebody else or to judge someone based on whatever that person, whether it has to do with art or anything else. You know, um, I have a gripe with with whatever kind of people, and they don't have to be, you know, Jews vis-a-vis -vis what proper Judaism is, but proper anything that that is judged uh, for me that that's that's a bit of an issue. So yeah, I think for the Jewish artist, it's the artist who makes that decision. Toby Khan makes this mag this wonderful, wonderful stuff. It's all abstract, so you could say, well, what's Jewish about that? Toby says, because Judaism is in every fiber of my being, everything I do is informed with that. And so someone like me might try and parse and say, well, you know, this is what I see is specifically Jewish, but, but it almost doesn't matter from his point of view. It, it, it's, it's Jewish art, which again, doesn't mean it's not other than Jewish art at the same time. My mom took a course with Louise Nevelson at Hunter College. Uh -huh. Never mentioned anything about Jewish or Louise Nevelson being Jewish or anything else. I yeah, thought it was quite I'm not surprised. <laughs> Growing up in Yiddish speaking Maine, to whom does she speak Yiddish? Her family, her family, because yeah. they, they were from Eastern Europe. Yeah. I don't remember why, I've forgotten now why they moved to Maine, but they did. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, so she grew up speaking Yiddish. And maybe she didn't like her family. Maybe she, you know, maybe she felt odd as a Yiddish speaker up in Maine, where they barely speak English. Um, I spent a lot of time up there, so I'm allowed to say that. Um, and I love Maine, so I'm allowed to say that. Um, and, and maybe that, you know, one never knows what the reasons for someone's embrace or denial of this or that aspect of one's, you know, being, what, what, the, what the source of it is. All right, so I've got a few personal notes from my mishpacha, whom I thank, Ori, I was that was really one of the most fascinating talks I've heard in a long time. And as I say, I honestly could sit and listen all evening, but I think we'll think we'll call it a day. There was a very large crowd, very good attendance. Thank it you. was an 
Terrific. Well, someone did note that I gave a, a very similar, by coincidence, a similar lecture Wednesday evening uh, in the context of this exhibit that I mentioned. It was similar. It was actually not identical. I mean, the, the general issues, of course, are always going to be the same. But the way I framed it and, and, and wove it was a little bit different, aside, obviously, from the fact that Wednesday I was using objects from that exhibit, and today I was using objects from the Kaplan Museum. Um, and that lecture was at Addis Israel. Yes. Which used to be the Sixth Street Shul in That's Washington, D.C., of which my grandfather ah. was an officer at the ah. beginning of the 20th century. Fantastic. Yeah. We're glad we got this. So, and everyone's glad, glad we got to hear you speak. It was a Thank wonderful, you. wonderful Thank talk. You. Thank you ever so much. And uh, next time in Houston or in Jerusalem. Yes. <laughs> okay. Applause for Ori. Thanks again, Ori. Thank you so very much. Have a great evening, everyone. Take care. Do you see who did that question? Or who told them that?